Howdy, folks. Thanks for checking in to Mr. Ulrich's Land of Biology.com. I, of course, am Mr. Ulrich. In this notes cast, which is the third in a three part series on our tour through the cell, we're going to be talking about those organelles that are involved in the chemical reactions, making energy available for all those other chemical reactions that have to go on within the cell. To quickly recap what we've been talking about cells having to do in order to stay cells, uh, they have three big processes that all of the other chemical reactions are kind of supporting or working together to do. One, of course, is making those proteins, the workhorses of the cell, the things that are going to go out and make all of those chemical reactions possible. And then, of course, they have to have ways to get the energy out of some molecules and transfer that energy into other molecules so they can do things with those molecules. And of course, they need to be able to make more cells so they can achieve genetic immortality, uh, as well as repair multicellular organisms uh, and renew those parts as they get worn out like we do. In this video, we're going to focus on the uh, organelles and the processes that are involved in using energy. Life is expensive. It costs a lot of energy to fight that process of things falling apart, of chaos reigning supreme, of everything trying to break down. And so cells then need a constant input of energy. And us heterotrophs, of course, need to take in those molecules that have lots of chemical potential in them and convert them into forms that our cells can use. We also need to have ways that we can take in oxygen since aerobic respiration is way more efficient than anaerobic respiration. And us big clunky eukaryotes need efficiency in order to stay big and clunky. The bottom line, of course, is to make ATP, to get that energy currency molecule that I'm hoping you've heard of. And we're going to talk way more about as the this video and other videos ensue. We can't, of course, forget that when we make compounds, we also end up with waste products that need to be excreted. And so removing waste is also going to require energy. It is certainly notable that the production of ATP is the bottom line for not just animal cells and heterotrophs, but also plant cells, autotrophs, and indeed all cells utilizing the same molecule uh, in much the same way uh, certainly gives us more food for that idea of uh, a common ancestor. It's simple and certainly easy for us to think of cells as using glucose as the fuel molecule to drive all the chemical reactions. Uh, and now that we know a little bit more about the biochemistry, um, we should know that it's not used directly, that that glucose has to be converted into a form that all of those chemical reactions can actually use to work. And uh, we certainly associate the mitochondria, the powerhouse of the cell, uh, as the place where these chemical reactions converting glucose into ATP are going to take place. We're going to learn more about it later on. We're going to spend quite a bit of time talking about um, chemical reactions of uh, aerobic respiration and anaerobic respiration, for that matter. Uh, but for now, we can associate it with uh, the mitochondria, but it's not the only place where energy is converted from one form into a form that can be usable. The chloroplasts also do this, um, except they're going to be converting sunlight into ATP. And again, we're going to spend more time talking about exactly how that takes place. Um, but certainly that conversion is happening. They take the sunlight uh, and convert it into ATP, which they then use to make into carbohydrates. It's the way they store their energy for later on. Again, we'll talk more about this later. As we discuss mitochondria and chloroplasts, it's notable to uh, see how similar they are and how different they are from the other organelles, the other membrane-bound organelles. Uh, yeah, they certainly are involved in transforming energy and taking energy and making it usable to the cell by uh, turning it essentially into ATP. Uh, they're going to do this by utilizing, and this is one of the things that makes them different, by utilizing a double membrane. Um, I like to describe the mitochondria and the chloroplasts chloroplasts uh, do this to uh, some degree as well, but uh, the mitochondria is like a big bag stuffed inside of a small bag, uh, and so you get all these uh, wrinkles. Uh, the double membrane allows for kind of a different compartment between those membranes than you get on the inside of the membrane itself. Again, we're going to talk about this uh, quite a bit later on. 
they are certainly interesting in that they both have their own DNA. Uh, they kind of uh, synthesize their own enzymes to a degree. Um, uh, they certainly divide on their own. Uh, they really are kind of their own organisms. Uh, and this lends itself to the endosymbiotic theory, which we're going to talk about later on, how they were once probably free living organisms themselves. Looking a little closer at the mitochondria, uh, again, powerhouse of the cell. Uh, we need to associate it with cellular respiration and generating ATP, but as we're going to find out, um, cellular respiration is actually going to start in the cytoplasm, so we do make some ATP without the mitochondrion, but uh, really the mitochondrion are generating uh, most of the ATP um, from the breakdown of sugars, and not just sugars, but other fuels, fats, and stuff, and we'll talk about how that happens again later on. Uh, this is going to take place in the presence of oxygen in the mitochondrion, so mitochondrion are uh, aerobic. Uh, they, they only really work if there is oxygen available. Uh, and they use this uh, process of catabolism, uh, breaking down larger molecules uh, to transfer that energy to uh, ATP. Uh, and since this is done in the process of oxygen, it is uh, called aerobic. Let's take a little closer look and focus on the structure of the mitochondrion. Uh, again, it's two membranes. Uh, you got a smooth one on the outside. The inner one is uh, folded in forming those cristae when you cut it into a uh, cross section. They look like fingers. Um, the reason why you have all the folds is uh, because the surface area uh, is increased by having uh, the cristae there. And all of the, well, many of the enzymes that are involved in catalyzing the reactions are actually bound to the membrane itself. And so the more membrane you have, the more enzymes uh, to catalyze their um, reactions. Now having the two membranes also gives us a fluid filled space between those two membranes. And it also gives us an internal space, uh, the matrix of the mitochondrion itself. Uh, and in the matrix is where you're going to find its own DNA. You find their mitochondrial ribosomes uh, where they make their own enzymes. Uh, again, kind of uh, semi-autonomous uh, critters there, mitochondria. Uh, now, why the two membranes? This is going to set up this great example for us of uh, compartmentalization, uh, the biochemical uh, difference between the inner membrane space and the matrix itself is going to drive uh, the important chemical reactions of chemiosmosis uh, that uh, make most of our ATP. So again, compartmentalization is kind of the name of the game here. Oftentimes you get shown way too many artists rendition of the mitochondria. So um, here's an actual transmission electron micrograph of the mitochondria itself. And uh, sometimes you'll see them drawn as like they look like uh, uh, sausages sliced in half with a little uh, mustard on it. Or sometimes they look like a slipper um, that has like cat poop in it or something. I don't know. Uh, but there's an actual picture so you can kind of see what they're basing it on. We are going to spend more time later on in the year talking about all of the chemical reactions that are involved in converting glucose and oxygen into carbon dioxide, water, uh, and usable energy for the cell. Uh, for us right now, we should recognize that structurally, this is taking place, these chemical reactions are taking place at those membrane-bound enzymes uh, within the inner membrane of the mitochondrion. Uh, this is where uh, most of the ATP is going to be generated. As cells live and grow, so do their mitochondria, and the mitochondria divide on their own uh, through their own process of binary fission that looks an awful lot like how bacteria divide. And this gives us a little bit of a picture uh, into what may have happened as far as the evolution of eukaryotes from prokaryotes. Mitochondria are uh, essentially a commonality amongst all eukaryotes, even plant cells. Don't forget that. Um, either a huge single mitochondria in itself or hundreds or thousands of them. The number of them is actually dependent upon the energetic needs of the cell itself. Um, the more energy needed, the more mitochondria you're going to find. So when we think about cells that would have lots of mitochondria, active ones like muscle cells or nerve cells or sperm cells uh, are going to be the ones to think of. 
it's super important for us to remember that mitochondria are a commonality amongst all eukaryotes. We find them not just in animal cells, but we find them in plant cells as well. And we can't forget funguses and protists. They have mitochondria as well. Speaking of plants, we can't focus all of our energy on mitochondrion. Uh, the chloroplasts are associated with plants. Uh, they're a group of organelles called plastids. Uh, we don't need to know our amyloplasts from our chromoplasts. Um, we should know the chloroplasts are where uh, chlorophyll is found and are the site of photosynthesis. Uh, we find them in leaves and all the other green structures of plants. Uh, we also find them in uh, photosynthetic eukaryotic protists like algae. Looking at the structure of the chloroplast, again, we can think of them as two membranes. It's a little bit different rather than having one big bag shoved inside of a small bag. It's really lots and lots and lots of smaller bags shoved inside of a big bag. Um, the uh, bags themselves are, are called thylakoids and they're flattened sacs and they uh, form these stacks called grana. Again, it's not important that we know our stroma from our grana. The important thing is to recognize is that uh, just like we have in the mitochondrion, um, we have this um, two membranes. So we have the uh, increased surface area of lots and lots and lots of small little structures. Um, and we also have this compartmentalization. Uh, I have a different environment in the uh, uh, stroma as I do inside of the thylakoid itself. Just like with the uh, mitochondria, having lots of small sacs inside of the uh, chloroplast gives us more uh, surface area for all those membrane-bound enzymes, and it's there where we're going to find the chemical reactions taking place, converting carbon dioxide and water, using the energy from sunlight into glucose and oxygen. Looking at chloroplasts from a bit more of a functional aspect, yep, they're where photosynthesis takes place. Uh, as we've been saying, they're going to generate ATP and transform that solar energy into a usable form. Uh, they're going to make sugars, glucose uh, predominantly, and carbon dioxide uh, and water. Just like the mitochondria, they move, they divide, they have their own DNA, um, uh, just like uh, bacteria. We associate chloroplasts with leaves and greenness, although I'm recording this in late October and it's certainly not very green out there right now. Um, but the primary pigment in plants uh, is chlorophyll. And the reason why chlorophyll is green uh, is because it absorbs all of the other wavelengths of light and reflects the green wavelengths. Now, in there are other pigments that we'll talk about later that do actually reflect the reds and reflect the oranges and reflect even some of the kind of more purpley ones. Um, but those are the secondary pigments and uh, we're seeing those now in October. Please familiarize yourself with the um, artist rendition of the perfect plant cell here uh, and be able to identify the major parts. Mitochondria and chloroplasts are certainly similar to one another, but they are different from the other organelles. They are not part of the endomembrane system, even though they are themselves membranous, made of membranes. They grow and reproduce semi-autonomous organelles by themselves. They use their own ribosomes to make their own uh, proteins using their own DNA from their own circular uh, chromosome. And of course, who else has uh, these characteristics? good old bacteria. Even their ribosomes are just like bacterial ribosomes. This brings us to one of my favorite uh, biologists, Lynn Margulis, um, and the endosymbiotic theory. Uh, she is famous for putting forth the idea that mitochondria and chloroplasts were once their own free-living bacteria uh, that uh, developed a symbiotic relationship with a different cell um, and eventually became dependent upon one another. Uh, and the evolutionary advantage allowed that relationship to develop uh, where one supplies the energy and the other one gives the raw materials for that energy process and uh, they're not gonna get eaten unless the big cell gets eaten themselves. This timeline is uh, illustrating a 
probable sequence of developments of um, not just the engulfing of the uh, probable mitochondria uh, and the uh, chloroplast, but also the development of the endomembrane system itself. Functionally comparing them, uh, even looking at the chemical reactions themselves, uh, you know, photosynthesis is essentially taking carbon dioxide and water uh, and converting that into glucose and oxygen, where respiration is taking that glucose and oxygen and converting it back into carbon dioxide and water, which is a switchy switchy of, and of energy. So even their chemical reactions are very, very similar, just really reverses of one another. This naturally leads us to what some call the great energy circle of life. I just call it the carbon oxygen cycle, uh, where the sun's energy through photosynthesis in plants is converted into ATP uh, and glucose and sugar, uh, as well as oxygen. And that glucose and sugar in the presence of oxygen is uh, converted through respiration, aerobic cellular respiration into ATP, uh, as well as carbon dioxide and water, which then goes back into the process of photosynthesis and around and around and around it goes. Though we think of animal cells and plant cells and protocells and fungus cells and bacterial cells for that matter, uh, capable of independent life, they really aren't. Uh, we are completely dependent upon all of the other cells around us. So the more we know about them, um, well, the, I think the better off we are and the better we can do things. Well, I think that's enough for now. Thanks again for checking in Mr. Ulrich's Land of Biology. I, of course, am Mr. Ulrich. I hope my uh, weeping left eye didn't bug you out too much. I've got some metal in my eye, and it certainly hurts, but uh, we're soldiering on. If you have any questions, please feel free to drop them in the comment section below or drop me an email, or if you're doing an Ed puzzle, I'm sure you have a question at the end uh, to put them in. Other than that, uh, I hope to see you all in class because I miss you all. Have a good one.